Autorhythmic cells have the uh, pacemaker potential, and um, let me start the study. Here. So this, uh, in three frames, shows you everything you need to know about the ash potential of the autoimmune cells. And so a little review. They set the threshold potential at negative 40 millivolts. And the resting membrane potential, well, it's not really rest, but I'll just, they start at maybe 60 there. And um, as a cell slowly depolarizes the threshold, what they tell you in the first slide, if you look where it says pacemaker potential, well, we point to what I'm talking about. Here, this part there, what I just drew, that is the pacemaker potential. That's the question on on the quiz, okay, right there. That slow depolarization to threshold. <coughs> A slow depol to Threshold. So, why does the cell not stay at rest? There's no resting membrane potential. It gets to a negative thing, and it's like the channel is open. So let's skip to this one here. It says IF channel is open. Now in physics, I is current. Subscript F means these are called funny channels. Sometimes there are channels that open when the cell is hyperpolarized, and they carry a sodium current. So that's how you get this pacemaker potential. So I gotta write, I gotta write this somewhere. Right Funny channels open when these these autorhythmic cells are hyperpolarized. These cells are hyperpolarized. So the cell potential gets like really negative, like negative 60. That's hyperpolarized. These channels open. Yeah, that's why they don't have a resting membrane potential. They open and uh, these funny channels open. Funny channels are also called AKA HCN channels. Don't worry too much about what that stands for, but make a connection. The H does stand for hyperpolarized. Uh, if you see it as like cyclic nucleotide, you don't have to worry about that, but it's talking about how the channels open. They open when they're hyper the cells hyperpolarized, and the current that carries the that goes through those funny channels are called funny currents. Funny currents are carried by sodium channels, actually like sodium ions. So that's why they say there's a net sodium into the cell here, causing a, a polarization to threshold. So that's what you got. They, once a cell reaches threshold, um, because of this pacemaker potential, you get an ash potential. And um, lots of calcium channels open, so the depolarization is caused by calcium.
then when they close, you get a repolarization event due to um, potassium. So then you repolarize back to negative 60. And when you're hyperpolarized, guess, guess what opens? The funny channel is open again. And like I said before, you slowly depolarize the threshold. Those funny channels open, you get a net sodium current in. So calcium causes the depolarization. Potassium causes the repolarization, and the funny currents are carried by sodium. It's pretty straightforward. I'm going to move on. Same picture, just showing you the three phases there, one, two, and the three. Simply put, number one is the pacemaker current, the pacemaker potential, two is dipole, three is repole, that's it. And uh, the important thing about this is, <clears throat> this is happening in the SA node, and the rate of this firing determines the heart rate. That's the connection you need to make. Okay, this is the heart rate, whatever this rate is, because we're not giving you any time there. Well, we'll get into heart rate, but first, let's make a comparison between the two action potentials, the one we just looked at and the one we studied um, last time. And here, here's a list of things that we can use to compare the two, their similarities and differences. Pacemaker potential. Depolarization. <coughs> Plateau. Depolarization. And uh, we can call them for the autorhythmic the contractile. So you should go down the list. Only one of these cells has a pacemaker potential. That was I asked you that. Did you get it right? This one. Boom. resting membrane potentials, and they go straight to depolarization. Now, they both have a depolarization, but the currents are carried, uh, those depolarization currents are carried by different ions for the ion rhythmic. Well, I just said it, do you remember? Calcium. The contractile cells, this is the strongest current of the heart, it's the sodium. Plateau was that delay in repolarization. Which one does it apply to? These ones. These ones. They both have repolarization, both carried by the potassium current. Now, only one of these cell types has the striations and the sarcomeres to generate tension. Which one? Mm, these. These generate the tension. All right, comparison over. Let, let's shift back to talking about the autorhythmic cells because they determine the heart rate. Um, basic rhythm. We call it the sympathetic 
the accelerator, and the parasympathetic nervous system, the brakes. Now the heart beats intrinsically. The pacemaker happens all by itself, but you can influence it. You can speed it up or slow it down. Accelerator, brakes. So there's a picture of um, that, modifying the rhythm of the heart. This is the autonomic nervous system, A and S. I'm just saying you can modify the heart rate. Now you have the two divisions. The parasympathetic um, division, the actions carried by the vagus nerve. Now on this picture, it's the purple nerve. Okay. So what they do is they show it, show you um, efferents going to SA and AV node. You can influence SA, AV node, uh, sympathetic. You can influence well, the same thing. SA, AV, but add to that the myocardium. The myocardium has adrenergic receptors. So the effects of, well, the sympathetic nerve, it's the, the chemicals are catecholamines, epi and norepi, right? That are influencing this. as well as um, the parasympathetic acetylcholine. <coughs> it can affect the, S the cells of the SA and the AB node. They affect it in different ways, and these traces kind of show you how they can affect the heart rate by affecting the physiology of the autorhythmic cells. And so the top frame, call it normal, and they give you a heart rate, our, our typical textbook, 75 beats per minute. And I like how they purple out the hyperpolarization, so it's easy to see. The effects of acetylcholine is, you see how I have this deeper purple? It's like you're starting from a more negative potential. It requires more time to reach threshold as a result. Therefore, your heart rate is slower, call it 40, okay? So there's a couple things going on in the effects of uh, ACH. To start from a more negative potential, one of the effects of ACH is to increase the hyperpolarization by opening more potassium channels. So if you open more potassium channels, um, you're going to repolarize a little bit more red line. You just extend a little bit past what you would normally hyperpolarize to. Therefore, you start from a more negative potential. what I'm writing. Start from a more negative potential. happens is um, you decrease the second messenger 
Second King and P being the second messenger. The effect this has is you close more calcium channels. Now calcium, those are the channels that help you get depolarization. The effect this has, when you close more of those channels, you decrease the slope of your um, membrane potential, of your pacemaker potential. Decrease slope of pacemaker potential. So the effect that is, is like, if the black line is normal, decrease the slope is like you just kind of like make it less steep so it's like like that that means it's going to like take longer to reach threshold both of these the one and the two takes longer to reach threshold okay that's the we'll call that the net effect questions on that? It's pretty straightforward. I'm just trying to explain the cell physiology, why it slows it down. After all, this is a physiology class, right? It slows it down. You know these kinds of details? Well, anyway, so that's the parasympathetic, call it the brakes. Quote, unquote, the brakes. This is the accelerator. Using a car analogy. And, um, well, it's going to have the opposite effect. If you look at the top frame or normal, resting heart rate, that's the catecholamines. We've got a couple things going on here. Catecholamines will produce these shorter action potentials. You start from a less negative potential, and it requires less time uh, to reach threshold. One reason is you open those funny channels earlier. So the effect of that is now you start from a, a less negative potential. Looks like um, use a different color here. When you repolarize, you'll repolarize and you just kind of stop short because you open these channels earlier. You start from less negative. But uh, the effect of catecholamines is to also you, you open up more calcium channels. So that will kind of like increase the slope of your pacemaker potential. So to increase the slope, that means you kind of like make it less steep, kind of like go up like that. 
going to run it. So the effect of that is, well, the net effect of both of these things is takes less time to reach threshold. You get a tachycardia, heart rate 120. So just by looking at it, uh, to be fair, I should kind of give you a normal to compare. So therefore, B is is what? Which sympathetic or parasympathetic? Parasympathetic. Therefore, C is sympathetic. Just look at it. So is it faster? Is it slower? Sometimes they tell you. It makes it an easy question to answer. So that's how you modify, modify the heart rate. And now, this kind of leads right into my next set of lecture slides, which is cardiac output. Because the heart rate is determining how much blood the heart pumps out. And these are something, this is something we definitely want you to know and be able to calculate. I said calculate. So for the next test, uh, He's an old school calculator. If you want to use a calculator, it's got to be one like this. <laughs> Not this exact same one. You can't use your phone, is, the, is my point. Okay. I know your phone has a lot of things that I don't want you to use during the test. Man, I had to go buy one of those. You don't have to. Just do it like, write it out, multiply. You can do it without a calculator. But usually, you're too frazzled to want to do that on the test. So I understand if you want to do It's up to you. All right, so I have these two things colored because um, cardiac output is a product of heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume. Okay, so we'll learn how to calculate it. We'll spend a lot of time talking about some concepts related to stroke volume. And when we get to like um, this part of the unit for the heart, it's really not new information. Once I go through the cardiac cycle of ECG, everything is kind of like the concept you heard, but maybe the term you haven't heard. So I'm to make sure that all the terms we use for this are, are given. We'll also talk about the effects of endurance exercise on cardiac output. All right, so simply put, when we say it's a product of, that means cardiac output, you must multiply the heart rate and stroke volume. Heart rate is the number of beats per minute, and, and as we just said, you can modify that, right, with the accelerator or the brakes. Uh, stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped out by a ventricle with each beat. We already talked about that. Does everyone remember the number I kept throwing at you for that stroke volume? 70 milliliters is correct per beat. In a condition of rest, there's a typical cardiac output, some volume per unit time. And it can increase quite a bit during the condition of exercise. You, you circulate more blood because you're trying to get more blood to the working muscle beds. So let's calculate it. Say I have to give you those numbers. I, I'll change them a little bit for the test. <laughs> maybe. Cancellation 75 times 70. Oh, well, it's a good thing I have a calculator right here. Yeah, uh, 
If you want to convert to leaders, that's that's common. You should be able to do it in your head, but you just want to do that too. It's uh, always in milliliters and one liter. And that will give you 5.25. So that's how you do that. We move on. Uh, other things. You should know that the stroke volume can be calculated given the end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume. So these data, and those numbers might be hard to read, the EDV is the gas tank is full, so to speak. We need to pump that blood out. That's 130. Okay. And then pump it all out, but not quite all of it. You have 50 left. So, um, given those numbers, a stroke volume will be, just subtract one from the other, 80, okay? Uh, the other thing is um, the ejection fraction, the percentage of end diastolic volume that is pumped from the ventricles. So this is a percentage, okay? It's a fraction. It's the fraction you eject. So a percentage is always um, the part divided by the whole. Ejection fraction. Percent is always divided by the whole, all the time, 100. And um, so our part is the part that's ejected, which would be the stroke volume. The whole is the whole amount of blood available to pump, which is the EDV, okay, times 100. So that, that's the amount ejected. Calculate stroke volume and ejection fraction given that. You have to be able to see these numbers at the bottom. 50. I'll put it in the back. Can you read that? 120. If I gave you that, could you calculate those things? Go ahead and take a minute and do it now. You'll have to do this on the test at some point. See if you can do it now. And if you want to use your, the calculator on your phone, now is acceptable. You know, that should have been enough time. Did, who, who calculated ejection practice? Just shout out the percentage. 58.3? Yes. Okay, that's what I got. Yeah. calculate stroke volume, that's the first thing you got to do. Subtract 50 from 120. So that gives you the stroke volume. 70 over 120? Yeah. Oh. And what is the 120? The end diastolic That's right. And that's how you would do it. Is it always going to be 70 over 120? Is the stroke volume? Well, no. It will change. Um, I won't keep the numbers the same for you on a test. 
Like, all of us in this room, are we all 70 over 120? Of course not. Yeah. Is 70 the same as normal? Huh? Is 70 the same as normal? Yeah, it's kind of like the textbook normal. Yeah. Yeah. sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, so we're going to talk about that. I want to talk about the variants of uh, stroke volume. Again, no new concepts, just kind of like new words. Uh, preload, afterload, contractility, so let's kind of briefly introduce those terms. Preload is the amount um, ventricles are stretched by the blood that fills them. Okay? Think of the ventricles as an empty bag, and when they fill with blood, you kind of stretch the ventricular wall a little bit. Um, and so, in terms of the cardiac cycle, that, it, that occurs during inflow or outflow. When will you fill, inflow or outflow? You fill during inflow, right? So that's not new. But there is a law I haven't mentioned yet. During that time, there's something called the frank Starling law of the heart, and I'll get to that. But when you finish filling, the volume of blood that's in the heart that stretches the walls is the EDV, right? That's, that's not new. The thing about it is the end diastolic volume, that is the preload, okay? You're loading the heart is the preload. Preload is basically the end diastolic volume, the EDV. And uh, the principle is, if you increase the preload, you increase the stroke volume. That's kind of the rule. So, preload, that's like the inflow. So it's like more in. Would you consider stroke volume, inflow, or outflow? Inflow or outflow, what do you think? The outflows have it. So that's like more out. So more in, more out. The heart will pump all the blood that's returned to it from the veins. Right? So this more in, more out is basically the Frank Stein law of the heart. More in, more out. So more and more, okay, because afterload, that's like the back pressure of the blood on the artery sitting on top of the heart. Um, this is um, a stress. It's called um, the afterload stress. And um, you want to think about the end systolic volume here, okay? the amount that's left over after ejection. If afterload stress increases, that's, that's not good. The heart has to work harder uh, each time. Um, let's say you have a person with normal blood pressure. Top number is 120. Let's take a person with hypertension. Top number 160. Okay. Which heart has to work harder with each beat? The one with 120 or 160? 160. You got to go to 160 every time. You're working hard. That's that's more afterload stress. 
you imagine that every single time your heart beats, it's got to pump against a higher pressure? It's not good. When you want to treat that patient, uh, get the blood pressure down. Uh, so it, that, that's basically this, right? So um, the rule is if you increase that afterload stress, you're going to have increased ESV, decreased stroke volume. Or another way to put it, increase afterload, decrease stroke volume. All right, contractility is how much force the ventricle can generate. Remember, the heart is a muscle. Remember that term I, I mentioned, a functional sensation? This, this kind of leads to the contractility. Because the heart is a functional syncytium, I explained that thing where you don't have motor unit recruitment. You can't like recruit more motor units to fire to increase the force. The entire heart's already beating. So each individual cardiac muscle cell must contract harder. So we refer to that as contractility. Uh, the heart can be harder, okay? And if you increase the contractility, you increase the stroke volume. Now in the lab, we try to get you to see that by measuring the QT interval. After exercise, in your subject, you're supposed to observe a shorter QT interval. Because exercise, you get more catecholamines, right? Um, like if you go sprint around the track, and try to be still, and your hands will be shaking. It's hard to do fine things because um, of all the catecholamines. And your heart's beating faster and harder, and you're supposed to see a reduced QT interval. I will look for that <laughs> when I read the reports, see if you found that. Well, okay, uh, a little more unpacking here about preload. And um, I've taught from this picture for years, and I start seeing pictures every year, you start to see mistakes. There's a mistake on this picture. Let's look first and look what it's intended to teach you. Preload, see how they, they're illustrating how it stretches the wall? That's what we want you to see. Afterload is to try to pump, press the blood against the weight of this column of blood sitting on top of your aortic and pulmonary valves. The thing that's incorrect is, shouldn't these be closed? They should be. And so that's the mistake I caught. Well, don't worry about it, it's all right. Understand preload and afterload. That ventricular filling occurs before the contraction. So it's basically the venous return right here and the filling time. So, the Frank Starring Law of the Heart, more in, more out. The more you fill the, the ventricles, the harder they will contract to increase the preload. Or, I'm sorry, the, the harder they will contract to eject the increased preload. This ensures the heart will pump all the blood returned to it from the veins. We noted that. That is the Frank Starring Law of the Heart. So this law basically says if you increase preload, you increase the stroke volume. However, uh, let's really understand why that is. Why do the ventricles contract harder if you fill them more? It's all to do with that stretch. You stretch, you contract harder because by increased filling, you increase preload, you stretch the bag. And what you're doing here in italics is you're reaching that opt optimal length tension relationship of the sarcomere. Let's remember that the sarcomere is the smallest um, structural unit of the heart, of, of muscle, okay, skeletal and cardiac. And um, let me show you this next figure here. This was from that muscle chapter. And I don't remember looking at it, so that's why I introduced it right here. There is an optimal length tension relationship of the sarcomere. Okay, that, that's the concept. Talking about this.
increase that stretch. Reach a more optimal sarcomere length. You can increase the tension generated. SV or stroke volume. <clears throat> so go back and find chapter, the muscle chapter, and look for this figure. So I've got one similar, it's in there. This is not good, it's too short. It's like there's plenty of overlap between the myosin and macin, but there's no room to slide. Remember, these slide towards each other towards the end line. So you're too squished, you can't slide. So as you stretch out, this is the best. Okay? You have room to slide, both go in, and you have plenty of overlap of the thin filaments and the thick filaments for the cross bridge cycle. And that's the good one. So the more you fill, the more you stretch towards the optimal length. The question becomes, can you overfill? That, that's, not, that's not good because there's no overlap. You got plenty of room to slide, but if you can't form enough cross bridges, you can't generate that tension. This never happens in the heart because of, what's the covering of the heart again? Pericardium. See, that, that sac that surrounds the heart, it, it prevents overfilling. So you never kind of go over the hill there. Prevents overfilling. Let's move on. So to finish off this concept, with increased preload, ventricles are stretched because they receive more blood, which causes them to contract more forcefully. So this ensures that equal cardiac output of the RV and the LV. I mentioned that before. If you had any su sudden increase in the right ventricle, it's automatically matched by the left ventricle because of Frank Starr and the law of the heart. Right? Think about that for a second. The RV, let's say for whatever reason, that output increases. Where does blood go from the RV? It goes to the lungs. Right? And then the veins collect that blood and then return it to the LV. So, if you have an increase there, it's got to match it. Okay? It's, it's got to keep up. It's like these have to keep up with each other. If it doesn't keep up, um, things can get backed up in the lungs. So, this law says that the output will remain equal. Increase preload, increase stroke blood. Okay, moving on. Any questions on Frank Starr's law of the heart? Key is the stretch and the optimal length tension relationship. Okay, so the afterload stress has been kind of um, likened to a bench press. It's the impedance or resistance to emptying, right? You're, you're trying to push those valves open by squeezing the heart. And uh, there's a guy doing a bench press, and in this case, the heart's uh, barbell is basically pushing that valve open, you've got a column of blood sitting on top of it. Okay. Here's a nice picture of it, right? The blood sitting on top of the aortic and pulmonary valve. It's the resistance, the impedance to emptying. So there's a difference in the actual load stress on RV and LV. stress is 
is in, in P minus two ventricular emptying. And it differs from RV to LV. The blue arrow kind of points to the pressure that the ventricle must meet to open the valve. About 10 and 80. So see if you're with me here. Which ventricle has to generate up to 80? LV does. Uh, the RV, 10. It's much lower. The reason is, um, well, there's a few reasons. But the basic idea I always keep in my head is um, the pulmonary capillaries are surrounded, they surround these little air sacs. So you're kind of pumping against air, provides much less resistance. Yeah. Whereas systemic capillaries are usually surrounded by fluids, so it's harder to pump against that. Yeah. For example, try blowing up a balloon in the air, but then stick the balloon under water and blow. So it'll be harder, right? Um, however, I also, I also said this. Even though they pump against different pressures, output is equal. Let's move on. If you increase the afterload, the increased afterload has a negative influence on cardiac performance because it creates an increased workload for the heart. So the general rules are, I already mentioned these, increase afterload, you increase the ESV. So by default, if you're increasing the end systolic volume, aren't you decreasing the stroke volume? Different way of saying the same thing. If more is kind of left in the heart at the end of systole, <coughs> That means you pumped out less during the outflow. That's the general rule. Increase afterload stress. Decrease stroke volume. Increase ESV, ESV by default. You didn't pump it out, it gets left in. That's not good. You want to circulate more blood, not less. You want your heart to be stronger, not weaker. The things that can help it be weaker, which is not good, congestive heart failure, right? Maybe persistent high blood pressure. I gave the example of someone who has a solid blood pressure of 160 versus 120. Some causes of high blood pressure could be, um, as you age, your arteries get kind of more stiff, less elastic. Um, it's harder to pump fluid through a stiff tube than a elastic tube. That kind of happens as we age. Um, coronary atherosclerosis. These are the blood vessels that supply blood to the heart, right? You know, the LCA, the RCA, and all their branches. Causes ischemia in the heart. Now that's, that makes the heart weaker. If you've had a heart attack, okay? Sometimes people have heart attacks and they don't even go to the doctor. They sit around and talk to your family in the holidays, you know. They never say things like, um, man, I just started dripping in sweat. I had to just lie down. And I felt better later. You probably, they probably had a heart attack, okay? Uh, things like that, when the sympathetic is turned on. And, um, yeah, but anyways, these things that weaken the heart by default, increase the afterload stress. Okay. Uh, I remember one time I was working with a cadaver, and blood vessels are soft tissue organs. This artery was so hardened by atherosclerosis. Sclerosis means hardening. I couldn't even cut it with a scalpel. It was like so hardened from sclerotic plaque over time, kind of amazed by that. 
Contractility. Okay, so contractility is a marker of particular performance. It's basically how hard the ventricles contract. Skeletal muscle increases force by recruiting motor units. Cardiac muscle, as I said earlier today, is a functional sensation. All the muscle fibers are already contracting. Cardiac muscle depends on increased force by the individual fibers to get a stronger contraction. And uh, if your doctor ever tells you, you know, your heart is larger, that's not, that's not good. Usually it's good metaphorically if you have a big heart, right? But when the doctor tells you that, it's not good. Here's why. Um, that's usually indicative of some kind of heart failure. When the heart gets larger, it's not an increase in the muscle fibers. It's an increase in the connective tissue. And the connective tissue, they, they, they need blood just like the muscle does. So it kind of like increases the, the blood demand for the heart without increasing its ability to pump. So it's kind of like not a good thing in terms of uh, the medical side. Um, well anyways, let's talk about how the heart can increase contractility. Talk about one way, increase preload, right? The easy rule to remember, more in, more out. Now that's easy to remember, but what law is that? The guy's names, Frank to the starling. Remember those guys. Okay, increase preload, that'll increase contractility. Talk about that, getting the optimal late tension relationship. The other three are basically increasing intracellular calcium. cells, the contractile cells. Well, just increase its rate of uptake. Um, there's an enzyme, okay? The enzyme is calcium stimulated. Let's remember that there's an enzyme that kind of breaks down the ATP in the mouse and heavy head, that enzyme. So I put a picture of that. Um, and also, epi and norepi, they increase calcium's availability and they increase contractility. So I put a picture of um, the calcium leaving the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but let's remember that calcium causes a cross bridge cycle. All right. So shift gears. Um, another way to make your heart stronger is um, be fit, work out, because endurance or aerobic exercise is best for improving the capacity of cardiovascular system. It also reduces your risk for all the chronic diseases, cancer, heart disease, diabetes. You can't prevent it, but it does reduce the risk. Okay, so as we train, our heart becomes a more powerful pump, mainly by increasing stroke volume. The heart can do a much better job of getting blood to the working muscles. So exercise uh, improves capacity of, exercise that improves capacity of the cardiovascular system. It requires you to use about, uh, they say, 50% of the body's muscle mass in a rhythmical fashion. So the big muscle groups, like the core, like um, your, your, your thigh muscles, the quads, the hammy, the adductors, right, the big muscles. Rhythmical fashion, like swimming, jogging, the best one is cross-country skiing. Right? They always say that's the best one using the mo all the muscle groups, but uh, who, who does that? Does anyone ever want cross-country skiing? Maybe a couple people? Yeah, a couple few. But it's hard to do that because we live here, right? You have to drive somewhere to do it. But they say that that's the best one, use all the muscle groups. You gotta do it. Um, the bout of exercise has to be about 15 to 20 minutes per bout and about three to five 
uh, days per week. Um, let's see here. So I was kind of just tell students the fit factors to know you're working out good enough. Fit spell F I T T E. The F is frequency. Most days of the week. The American College of Sports Medicine says adults should exercise on all or most days of the week. For a class full of mostly young people, you should be out there six, seven days a week exercising. Okay? It, you know, that, that's what we say. The eye is intensity. There's a certain VO2 max that you want to do. Well, you can't know that, but basically, an easy thing to do is just monitor your heart rate. Um, you should be working out somewhere between 70 to 85 percent of your heart rate max. The heart rate max, well, a simple calculation. It's not the safest way to do it, but 220 minus your age. Okay, that doesn't consider your medical history at all. That's why I'm saying it's kind of quick and dirty. But to give you a rough, rough estimate, 220 minus your age in years. Okay, so if you're a 20 year old person, what's your max heart rate? 200. 200. And you should be working out at 70 to 85 percent of 200 BPM. So you're in the you're in the zone. Okay. A lot of people they do physical labor or other things, and, but that's not exercise. Okay, that might be good for your overall health over the long term, but it's not exercise. Uh, so to get the effects of exercise, that, that intensity is necessary. Each time should be the, the bout of exercise, right? I say there 15 to 20 minutes. I mean, it should be at least 30 minutes. Okay, if you accumulate 30 minutes of exercise, they even say it doesn't even have to be all at once. You can break it up. Okay. The type, you know, is it cardio, is it resistance training? I always say uh, the best type of exercise is one that you'll do. <laughs> Just getting people to do it is the thing, right? One that you'll do. Because if you do it and it's the best one, but you don't keep it up, then what's the point? Okay. And that kind of ties into the E, which is enjoyment. You know, for example, like, you know, my wife, she likes to go to the gym. When I exercise, I hate the gym. I don't want to see anyone's face, okay? Except my jogging partner, okay, he's okay. Um, so, you know, we're, we're different. But I got to pay for that gym. But pay now or pay later, right? You pay now and you put money in the bank, uh, so to speak, and you'll be healthier later. Um, trust me on that one. Okay, well... Let's move on. That was the intensity there. I already gave you that. You got smart watches. Keeps your heart rate right. It's so I don't even have one of those, but it's so easy now to stay fit. You got those fit beds. There's technology so great for keeping track of your fitness level. Okay. There are the uh, more endurance training effects on exercise. Preload. Exercise increases the volume of your blood, okay? So therefore, more is circulating. You're gonna have more venous return, more EDV, more stroke volume. Afterload, endurance training tends to reduce blood pressure. Mechanism unknown, we're not sure why, it just does. Contractility, your, your heart simply becomes a stronger muscle. A stronger muscle can contract more forcefully and you know pump more blood out. And um, I should mention, that exercise is a remarkable stress on the body. Typically, exercise should be prescribed by a doctor like pharmaceutical drugs. Okay, so I don't want you to go home and I heard this lecture on go tell grandma to go hit the track and they die and I get blamed for it. Nothing like that, right? I just said it. Exercise, exercise should be prescribed. Okay. Um, all right, so heart rate, it decreases. 
right? Your resting heart rate should decrease because it's a stronger muscle now. So um, I give you some ballpark number there, ballpark numbers, normal resting heart rate around 70, maybe endurance runners gets down to like 40. Just to give you an example of that. Let's say untrained person, untrained Jane Doe. Let's say her cardiac output, her body needs this much, okay, to be pumped per minute. The average resting cardiac output. So if you break that down, sorry the numbers, I should put this over here. It's 70 mils, um, say that's the standard cardiac output for an untrained person. The heart rate to accommodate that should be around 71. If that's the stroke volume, and that's the demands for an untrained person. But let's say she starts training, and training person sees the benefit of exercise, which is like a 20% jump in stroke volume. Well, her metabolic needs shouldn't change, because usually when you get fit, you lose weight. So your metabolic demand should actually decrease. But let's say it, it stays about the same. And so with a, a jump in stroke volume, from 70 to 84, her heart rate would decrease to 59. So it's just a simple multiplication. If your heart is stronger, the heart rate should slow down, and that's good for your heart. Throughout your whole life, it has to beat less. It'll last longer, it'll increase your lifespan. So think about it in that term, those terms. So here's a, another concept map of all the terms we talked about regarding stroke volume this morning. Preload, think about the venous return, the filling time, the EDV, right? If your heart rate goes down, resting heart rate decreases 70 to 60 to 50, what's happening to the filling time? You're increasing the filling time, right? So it's like all this is going to come into play to reject more with each beat. Afterload stress, keep your blood pressure down and um, you keep your ESV to a minimum. And the uh, contractility, if you increase intracellular calcium, it'll contract harder. All right, um, let's take a break. Now, since I'm a little ahead, I, when you come back from break, I, I want to start the next chapter. However, write a big line in your notes. Where I stop right now is the end of the material you're responsible for for your test on Monday. So let's take our standard 15 minute break. Ceiling. For those of you that have your labs done, 